Hello all you little golf nerds out there, swing geeks, thanks for joining me. I am Jason Sutton, welcome to another episode of the Golf Guru Show. I am the guru where it is my mission in life to tease out the habits, life lessons, secrets to success from some of the top performers in the teaching business and all their fields as well. This show is designed to help all of you coaches by bringing you the ideas, insights, and the journeys traveled to the surface via all of my high-performing guests. And this episode won't disappoint as I have my good friend Scott Calks on from Canada. And for those of you that don't know, Scott is one of the brightest minds in golf instruction. And you do not want to miss this combo as we d- dive deep into biomechanics uh, as well as some personal development and life lessons. As you know, we like to do on this show. There are so many subjects that we cover on this podcast that I don't want to even delay this thing a minute or a second more. You may want to pull the car over the side of the road before you get ready for this one. Get your pad and pencil ready. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Scott Calks. All right, Scott. Thanks uh, so much for coming on the show. Welcome, man. Thanks, man. This is uh, this is a real pleasure for sure to come and, uh, and do this. I... Uh, so happy that you could you could make it out. I know you're in Charlotte working uh, working with Mac Hughes, and we got to watch you coach today, which was a real treat. And I appreciate you letting me and the staff kind of be a fly on the wall. Thanks for letting me out. It's, uh, beautiful Carmel, what a great spot, and uh, you got got a great team there for sure. Um, I think you've got uh, one of the best gigs there, and and some of the best staff I've seen. So I appreciate it. Yeah, they they enjoy it. when I bring some top coaches in. They they love to to come and watch and learn so pretty cool so let's dig into it a little bit we're we're um we're gonna take the listeners back a bit because i always like to start with you know how you how you sort of got to where you are and then you know your childhood because i think it's it's really interesting to me and and into the audience of you know sort of how we got to where to where we are as, as coaches and as people Tell me a little bit about your childhood. What what kind of a kid were you? Well, you know what? Um, my my older brother and I uh, kind of learned to play uh, golf at a municipal track um, in London, Ontario, um, Canada. And um, it was interesting because our golf course didn't have a range. So we had a lot of kids that could really chip and putt because you're always waiting for a tee time. You're always you know playing nine holes and there's an hour wait before you get out again. And uh, so we'd chip and putt and, you know, play for shakes and hot dogs and all the rest of that. And so we developed a lot of really good juniors, um, but I wouldn't say anybody really had a, a great golf swing. So when I was a kid growing up, I was a, I was a good junior um, for sure, but I certainly wasn't a great junior, not enough to, you know, go away on scholarship or anything like that. So um, funny enough, I didn't get my first golf lesson until I was uh, 21 years old. Wow. And that was uh, with David Ledbetter and uh, saved up all my money. And I went down to see David for a week. This would have been 1995 or 6. And uh, spent a week with David and uh, Brian Mogg actually was his lead instructor at Lake Nona at the time. And um, I'd already turned pro at that point. And, and, um, but my ball striking certainly wasn't anything to write home about so it made a big difference so that kind of turned me on a little bit to uh, the teaching end of it Uh, you know early in my apprenticeship probably the first three or four years just a standard you know assistant pro at a at a uh, at a busy club and uh, taught a little bit and then decided after about three or four years that I really didn't see myself getting tied to the pro shop and uh you know, my, my father was a school teacher, my sister's a school teacher, so I think it's in the blood a little bit to teach, and I really liked helping people um, get better. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to learn was certainly how to get them better. And uh, so my journey was very interesting in, in the fact that um, I probably came at this more from the biomechanics end of it first. Uh, I went down and spent some time with uh, Dr. Scott Lephart in the University of Pittsburgh. Um, he had the first golf-only biomechanics lab in North America. 
So he was doing a lot of testing. This would have been maybe 2000 or so. Um, he was doing a lot of testing on player on tour players um, and basically had all this data, but I would say at that time kind of didn't know what to do with it. You know, we have all this great data, but how do you interpret it? And uh, that led me to uh, Chris Welch, um, Xenolink, and, uh, you know, learned a lot from Chris just about um, basically anatomy and biomechanics a little bit. And uh, that, that sort of uh, stemmed my interest to look into some other things. And, you know, I started to look at uh, later on, I think around 2008, I did a, uh, I went to a school, Stack and Silt, Stack and Tilt School with Andy mm -hmm. uh, Plummer and Mike Bennett. Uh, that was a lot of fun, and but that kind of turned me on a little bit to a little different viewpoint. You know, it was my first experience looking at, uh, let's say, the the Morad or the Mac O'Grady stuff, and and uh, learned a lot from them. And through them, I started to actually do some work with uh, with Grant Waite. Um, and Grant had, uh, you know, obviously worked with Mac for three or four years in the '90s. So I learned a lot from Grant. Um, about the Mac stuff as well, and that was a real interest. And did you get to spend any time with Mac? No, I've yeah. never spent yeah. any time personally with Mac. And and you know, I've got huge respect for kind of his body of work, if you will, that he's presented. Sure. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's it's obviously everybody has their Mac stories and and so on. And and uh, you know, some of those are funny, and some of those are a little bit alarming at times. But you know. I, I think that his contribution to the game of golf in terms of being able to figure all that stuff out in the eighties with a with a thirty frame per second VHS camcorder is phenomenal. And and whether or not, you know, a lot of it is certainly up for interpretation and, and maybe there are some uh you know, things that we know now with Trackman and Flight Scope with D plane that certainly may um, change some of the patterns, if you will, a little bit. But sure. the basics to it, I think, are brilliant, and, and it was very, very well thought out. Um, and sort of the, you know, and Andy and, and um, Mike did a great job of this too. It's just sort of the the taxonomy, if you will, or the, or the spectrum based classifying, so classifying, was, right? Yeah, and, and and nobody had kind of really looked at it with that sort of depth before, and. That was kind of fascinating to sort of the, uh, let's say, the organization of my brain um, to say, hey, if I do this at P2, this is going to happen at 3 and 4 and right. and look into it further. And that really, for me, married up nicely with the biomechanics and understanding how the body was working and, and what the different joint functions were doing. And I, I love the way that Mac was breaking down some of the specific joints and, and what they were doing, the travel and the rates of movement of each of those. And, um, you know, really very, very impressive stuff. So, um, you know, and from there, obviously, we, we start talking in, in sort of the 2000 uh, teens here that you've got the scientists, if you will, a lot more involved, like Quan and uh, good friends with Sasho and, and uh and, uh, you know, I spent some time talking to Dr. Nesbitt um, many years ago about some of his sort of findings. And I think it's our role as, as instructors to be able to interpret some of the data because, again, these scientists, they, they've got a lot of great information, but it, how is it applicable? Right. And I always look at it and say, you know, is it, you know, is it something I can use now? Is this something that maybe I'm going to think about a little bit, or is this something that maybe doesn't really make a lot of sense, and maybe it's just a, a resultant? Um, and I think we have to have a really fine screen, if you will, of the information that comes in, and, and some of those things kind of validate your teaching, and some of those things might actually run contradictory to your teaching. And I, th I think as instructors, we all have to... Uh, sometimes swallow our ego a little bit and just say hey you know what maybe i didn't quite have it figured out the way i thought it was going to work and right. maybe this this other approach might be better so you have to have an open mind at all times right right so then i started to uh i mean i i can thank the uh the internet for a lot of my success for sure i mean i i got to know grant i you know the toughest thing as you know to work with tour players is to kind of get inside their circle right and um you know with with Mackenzie Hughes, that was a different story. I've, I've worked with him for 12 years since he was, you know, a 15-year-old junior. Yeah, you caught junior. him as a kid coming up, right? Right. So yeah. that, was a, that was a fun journey, you know, going through the amateur ranks in college <laughs> and, 
and Webb, and then then obviously PGA Tour. But um, with with Grant, um, you know, I made a comment one day on one of his swings on Facebook uh, when he used to post a lot of swings on Facebook, and he, he kind of private messaged me and said, "Well, what do you mean by that?" And it was some you know biomechanical thing I mentioned, and and um, that kind of it's kind of like dating, you know, that kind of set off about two weeks of sort of back and forth. Sure. Uh, chatting, and he kind of said, "Well, hey, can you come down and to Florida, and do some work with with me and and my son Austin?" So I went down to Florida and and stayed with Grant, and we we spent a couple of days working on some things, and and um, you know, I really thought the changes I was going to make uh, would have taken, you know, a month or so to implement, and you know, Grant had it in two days. Like he is so talented, so phenomenal with yeah. just kinesthetically, sure. right? Like you tell him to move P four by a quarter inch, and he can feel it. Um, just, just fantastic stuff. And you know, it was interesting. It was a real learning experience for me at that time working with Grant because obviously he had this very structured approach to his ball striking, and um, you know, at the time was was sort of coming back from. He had tried some other things and kind of gone through stack until he was sort of on the tail end of, of stack and tilt, but he still wanted the geometry um, of some of the things that he was, he was sort of doing with, with Mac back in the uh, the 90s. And um, so it was really interesting to sort of bounce ideas off of him, and he would reference it back in sort of a, a Mac sense of, of, of things, right. and I'd be kind of giving it to him in a more biomechanical sense, and we kind of learned to speak similar language a little bit. And, and so I learned a lot from Grant for sure um about the geometry stuff and and hopefully uh well he probably didn't learn as much as me but um on the biomechanics so we got him a little faster and you know at the time uh you know he was pretty happy with his speed but he 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 didn't quite at that time like the way it looked if if you will and um you know that really set off a real point of discovery for me that understanding instead of looking for let's say one swing that was going to cure all that I change my thought process and say that really everybody just resides on a spectrum, right? And you've got the most, you know, so let's say technically ge- geometrically perfect players like Grant on one end. And then you've got Louis Eustazen or, or Roy McElroy on the other, end, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, where you've got geometry versus let's say pure dynamics and, and everybody resides on that scale somewhere. Um, and, Really, I think the roles of teachers, we have to decide where your player needs to go. Do they need a little bit more geometry? Do you need to reduce maybe degrees of freedom in the movement? Or do you need better biomechanics, better dynamics, create better speed production, um, or maybe a little bit of both, right? And that kind of led to the formation of of what I do now with sort of the Scott Koch certified worldwide stuff I've been doing um, was... I got asked by uh, Kenneth Hansen and, and Rasmus uh, Roliget in, in Denmark to kind of put my thoughts on paper and, and come and present uh, in Denmark uh, about uh, three years ago. And uh, we had 12 or 15 guys, guys come from Germany and Sweden and Denmark. And I kind of, it was the first time I kind of sat down and broke down what had already been going on in my mind for probably five years. But actually put it on paper and say okay well when you do uh you know radial deviation what is that doing to the the parameters of impact right if i add you know dorsiflexion to the trail wrist what's that going to change that impact and i basically went through all the things that i could think of um you know i call it sort of a 13 piece anatomy toolbox and i i said okay well if you manipulate these pieces how is that affecting impact Right. Each one of these individually, you know, taking that all the other pieces would stay the same. If I do this one thing, how was that going to change things? And 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 that became sort of this this presentation. That's, and that's how you came up with your yeah. Because that was that you're answering the questions before I can answer. There you or, go. Or, or I'm staying ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. No, because <laughs> that's that's what I had pulled up was the 13 accumulators and their effect on impact. Just looking at your curriculum, which is right. is fantastic. Yeah, really, I could have probably put 18 or 20 in there. Um, right. There's a few others that we talk about on there. But, you know, those are sort of some broad ones that I like to uh, to cover because I think that all of us have had 
some exposure to different systems, whether it's the golfing machine, whether it's, uh, you know, stack until a lot of network guys over in Europe, like it's huge in, in Europe. Uh, tons of the Danish guys are, are stack until German guys yeah. uh, as well. Um, and, you know, for the most part, I, I really like a lot of the structural things that, that they do. And, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, I think Andy, uh, Andy for sure is, is, is one of the best, um, sort of mechanics, if you will, out there for sure. And, um, I really think that if you marry up some of the geometry with some of the forces and torques and the speed production stuff and, and sort of when I do my presentation to my groups, I try and, and sort of hit it different ways. So the, the people in the room that are more, let's say, more ad based or, or whatever, or golfing machine based, kind of get their little taste, and then right, the language a, is very similar, right? I right, mean, it seems exactly. that that's what I'm seeing from. Just a tried lot of your to posts. sort of expand on it a little bit, and and as I said, we could probably have done a few more. Uh, uh, I call them accumulators, but really they should just be sort of anatomy toolbox pieces. Um. And it was fascinating for me. I mean, every time I presented, I just came down from rally the last two days um, presenting there, and and every time I presented, I I learn a little bit more. Sure, you know, it just it reminds you, and re- yeah, you and just kind of get, get a few thinking. connections happening, and and uh, I think it's really really powerful. Um, so when I try and, and work with my uh, instructors who are who are there for the certifications, I really try and and show them that I'm not trying to push my preferences on them. I'm just trying to show them, hey, if I manipulate this body piece or that body piece or this body piece, we can achieve what we need from a ball flight standpoint. So then, you know, we're not calling it anything specific. We're just building the best golf swing for, you know, Jason Sutton or whoever mm-hmm. it happens to be in front right. of you. Um, and and I, I think a lot of the guys really like that because then they, they have their own ability to create their own patterns if they want. If they want to call it... <clears throat> you know xyz pattern um they can and and you know i've i've had a lot of fun naming some of my own patterns probably six or seven that i like to teach but we all have players with with limited uh you know physical ailments and so on that that maybe can't do what you want them to do so if you understand how the anatomy works you might be able to find other ways of going around it so so describe so talking about patterns describe to me and the listeners the elephant trunk pattern <laughs> that's when it came up seth <laughs> seth thompson yeah i moved him, i moved him from uh into an elephant's trunk pattern so elephant's trunk pattern just uh was sort of a, a neat analogy that uh, like Rory McIlroy swing. So kind of like dog wags the tail or yeah. body body swings the arms type we'll, of deal. We'll, or? we'll call it kind of cracking the whip, really. Yeah. So you know, if an elephant kind of he's got an annoying line over there to his left, and you know he wants to get rid of the line, he's going to kind of swing his head to the right, and his trunk's going to follow, and then he's going to change direction with his head really quick, and the trunk's going to follow. Then he's going to sort of stop his head really quick, and that trunk's going to snap into that line and knock him over. And that essentially is, is how Rory swings. And, and uh, you know, it's sort of a um, fourth accumulator or left arm loading mm-hmm. across the chest right. happens dynamically between P3 and P5. So sort of halfway back to halfway down. So he's loading that fourth accumulator, that left arm across his chest um, in transition. And then right at impact, he's got that famous, you know, pelvic deceleration. Right where he goes from 770 degrees per second to negative 200. You know, that's an awful lot of change. And it's more of a reaction, right? It's not something that, obviously, he's not trying to do it. Is it more of just an energy transfer, deceleration type of deal? Yeah, exactly. And I think that uh, it's interesting when you look at his history because he learned playing golf with his father's clubs that were not cut down. Long and too heavy. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's kind of an interesting, interesting yeah. uh you know, obviously, there's a lot of uh, companies out there that are, are are trying to push kids into lighter clubs to to not sort of do that to them. But in mm-hmm. Rory's case, he kind of won the lottery uh, in terms of uh, kinematic sequencing of that club being too heavy, too long behind him. Is he'd have to go ahead and uh, you know turn really really hard and then really stop quick to get that club kind of back in front of him. And in the process of doing so, developed all this crazy speed um, with the elephant's trunk pattern. So, 
you know, the loading order with elephant's trunk is a little different than than what we call a constant radius or a more centered pivot. Constant radius just kind of, um, you know, really about moving the body and the arms at, at sort of a relative rate to each other going back and coming down so that hmm. the, uh, you know, there's not a what lot. What would be of, an example of that? Um. Well, basically, basically any of the Mac stuff really is is sort of a constant radius uh, by nature. So the constant radius really comes from from P six to P nine. Basically, the trail arm isn't sort of extending, so the radius between the wrist bone to the elbow is somewhat held. It's not a true constant radius for sure, right? I don't, Straightens later. Yeah, it, it's basically the the speed of the pivot is going to not allow that right elbow, the first accumulator, to pop out. Um, and it's something that's, I mean, Chuck Cook does that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually, I like that. Yeah, I like it a lot. It Especially tends... for driving. I don't know. I mean, I, we, I mean, you, I don't know if you heard any of the previous podcasts, but I've been kind of harping on this trail arm straightening spectrum. We did a little yeah. 2D video study, and it seemed to me and my staff that the later the trail arm extended, and obviously camera angles can fool you, the better the sure. driver of the golf ball. Like yeah. We talked the top five on the PGA Tour and the bottom five, and it seemed the bottom five were all straightening sooner. And it, have you found yeah, some, huh? something to that? Is that that's the pattern you're talking about? A thousand percent. Yeah. You know, um, when I had the chance to, uh, when Grant was working with, with Mike Weir, uh, you know, Mike Weir's trail arm extension rate was double the rate of PGA Tour average. There you go. Okay, and and as a result, uh, any time that that trail elbow extends really quickly, the way the anatomy works with the ligaments is as you straighten your trail arm, your wrist also extends. Yeah. That's so the, the problem the cast is pattern. right, yeah. exactly. So yeah. as soon as you do that, uh, you know basically that club face is chaotic and out of control. So you know your start lines become compromised. Your you know your curve becomes compromised. Sure. Um, so absolutely, if, if uh, you know, you heard me with Mackenzie today, right. you know, when he's swinging well, he's got a lot of trail arm bend still at impact. Yeah, I like that. I was, I, you didn't point it out, but a couple of times but I was like, I knew exactly yeah. what you were talking about there. When he gets into that slidey pattern we were talking about a little bit, um, yeah. you know, that right shoulder gets trapped behind his body. As a result, he has to extend the arm to get to the golf ball. And then the overtaking rate kind of increases, the closure kind of increases, and just the reliability isn't isn't quite as good. And, sure. Uh, so it's something we've been always been aware of, but uh, you know, in the last uh, couple of years, for sure, something that we always look for if he's rotating well, he's turning well, mm-hmm. we're going to see it impact. His, his thorax is open, his trail arm still going to be bent. He's still got some dorsiflexion in the trail wrist. Uh, and that tends to stabilize the club face immensely. That's that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, no, for sure. I 100% <laughs> correlate that one. Yeah, for you. Um, yeah. And I talked talked to John Sinclair and Tyler Farrell as well, and they were there. We've we definitely had some agreement on that, which is cool because the 3D guys are. How much 3D? I know you've done a ton of 3D. Yeah. How much have you done with your players, and how often do you kind of have you had Mac on there at much? I know he. It's interesting to watch you guys work because. You know, I'd worked with him a little bit when you sure. guys were interim, yeah. just talking to him. And I know you you can be technical in language, but when you teach, you're very non-technical, which I think is brilliant. Well, he, he's, I mean, that's just tailoring it to the student. You right. You know, like uh, he does not like, I mean, many times he's told me to shut up and yeah. and, uh, and that's okay. I, you I know? can see that. Yeah, yeah. We've he's... been t- we've been together for 12 years, so, yeah. you know, we kind of kind of get that. But over time... Uh, he understands technically what he needs to do, but he wants it to be in very simple, um, like you saw today. Yeah, he, he wants to create a feel to match yeah. up with whatever you're trying Just, to tell him. To be honest with you, the more mindless drills I can get him to do that are going to actually create the change, uh, the happier he is. Um, he doesn't like to think. I can see that. He doesn't like to think about what he's doing. He just wants to know that the drill is going to fix it. So. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and obviously we bounced that around. We gave him four or five different uh, drills there to sort of work on his footwork. Mm-hmm. Uh, today, you know, I'll probably have to come up with another three or four. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, you know, you get, he's probably not going to use them. He just like wants to have that. Yeah, many. <laughs> he just wants he just wants to put me through the ringer. Right? That's all it is. No, but uh, no, it's just you know he's when he plays well, he plays very much on the right side of his brain. So mm-hmm. his thought processes should be very vague, but very simple. So keywords, uh, not a lot of analytical thought. Um, you know, he plays extremely well when 
you know, things just simply say balance or finish or, mm-hmm. um, you know, today was, was kind of feeling, okay, just sit on the right side a little bit. You know, just, yeah. just very kind of simple keys for him are very powerful keys. So it's just coming up with the right keys for the golf course, but also the right drills that are going to reinforce the keys. And, 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 you know, flip side of that is when I was, when I was working uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Eduardo uh, Molinari, uh, Eduardo next to Grant is probably the smartest player I've ever met. He knows his stuff and, you know, he worked with Sean a little mm-hmm. bit and, uh, you're going to have Sean on, on uh, the next couple of days, but, uh, yeah. um, you know, work with Sean and, and, you know, he liked what he did with Sean by the way too. And, and, uh, a lot, he hit the ball really well, maybe a little bit on the lower side, but he really hit it well, really hit it really solid. More centered pivot, right? Yeah. Kinda. Very more centered pivot at the time. And, and, um, you know, when I got a hold of him, he was really struggling and, and, uh, kind of had a, a two way miss going and, you know, he's always fought for some reason when he played really great in 2009 and 10, when he was sort of top 20 player in the world. Um, you know, he had almost like a Steve Stricker move, you know, it was a very little wrist cock. Mm-hmm. That's what he won the USAM with in, in 06 it was a swing that basically was sort of Strickerish. There really wasn't any dramatic hinging. And then all of a sudden he kind of created this, this sort of buggy whipping, almost like a Sergio, but uh, even a little bit wilder kind of movement in the wrist. And um, it came to a point where as he would load in transition, he'd get a lot of quick negative beta. The problem is that I would flip into positive beta really fast so that the face was starting to turn down before P6. If he kept turning on that, he'd hit a low pull hook, so then he'd start to back out and he'd hit these these awful blocks so he had this kind of two-way miss when we got together and and that was just killing so what did you do what did you you look at some old video and maybe like try to get him back to where he played his best or well to be honest with this was a this was a real learning experience for me because yeah at first i i had him do what i wanted to do sure right so i i told him what i wanted to do and he was on board with he 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 understood exactly what he needed to do and and basically, we just routed the club a little bit differently going back so that when he would have that negative beta, it would just kind of happen in the right place as opposed to before it would kind of kick back and then kick over really fast. And we kind of went a little bit deeper with his arm, his hand path, uh, kept the club a little bit outside his hands, a little bit going back. That kind of led to almost a slightly across the line position at the top. Right. But from there, when he would go into his negative beta, it would it would kind of lay down nicely and come around at the right time. It would keep the sweet spot back longer, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And and when he did that, um, you know, he gained some speed. You know, uh, for about two weeks uh, at home, he was working on this, and he, he didn't have a round over sixty six. Like he was just playing really great. Uh, went back on tour and and uh, had some good success, but he'd have one bad round. And after about two months of that, he, he kind of called me up and said, listen, we've got we to maybe rethink this because, you know, I love what we're doing, but I can't do it for four days. And <laughs> at that point, I was kind of like, well, you know what, you're, you're all right, what do you, what do you think? Right? Yeah. And, and he uh, said, well, I asked him, okay, well, when, when you hit it really well, what did you do? He said, well, I've got. Like he's such an organized guy. I mean, mm-hmm. this guy is, you know, he's got a degree in statistics. I mean, he a master's in statistics. This guy's brilliant. Uh, he spends time making, uh, you know, he did the myroundpro.com with Mark Brody. Like he loves stats. Like he's just awesome with it. And so he's got every swing from 2005 to now cataloged on his computer. Oh my. And he can pull them up at any time, <laughs> right? So in like 10 seconds, he pulls up the swing and sends it to me. And it's it's like 2009 uh, World Cup that he won with uh, Francesco. Mm-hmm. And uh, he showed me some swings from 2010 when he was on the Ryder Cup team. And it was a vastly different golf swing. And he said, this is when I hit it the best. And I'm looking at it going, well, this is nothing what you're doing now. Like, this is, right. this is totally different. <laughs> um, so we went down that vein. We kind of said, well, let's, let's give it a go. Let's see if we can sort of recreate what you did in 2009 with maybe a little bit better structure because his structure was being compromised. You have a lot of seconds. I mean, he's a different still. person now, right? I mean, his body had to change. I mean, yeah, he's like, a little older. And... It's kind of like Tiger trying to go back to his old <laughs> yeah, exactly, 2001. Right? It's not going to happen. I mean, and at this time I was kind of like, I was really happy with where we had gotten this golf swing and, and, um, um, quite pleased with it. 
so we went back to it and and he worked on it diligently and he actually got it back really quickly because a lot of the feelings were like going home so he was able to sort of pick up on it and and get it uh get it back fairly quickly his misses were uh he went from sort of draw flight to a little fade uh went back out on tour and, and just was a little bit steadier a little bit more consistent and uh he used that swing and you know at the end of the year you know we kind of parted ways a little bit um basically i was never gonna see him in person anyway like he flew me to italy uh the first year that we were together and we did a bunch of online stuff but yeah it's tough it's just you know he's in italy and i'm here so it was gonna gonna be difficult to uh to sort of um, work that out which is fine and he said he's a very knowledgeable guy um you know every once in a while he sends me some swings and we talk about it but basically he's, he's got the same pattern and you know he won last year in morocco and you know got a two-year exemption mm-hmm. again on the european tour and uh this year has been a little bit up and down but uh more or less he's driven the ball much better in the last year and a half um i think statistically when when i got a hold of him he was hitting about 47 or 48 percent of his fairways so just way too low and uh, i think now he's he's up around 60 percent. so you know a marked improvement for sure that's got to be one of the most difficult things as a coach teaching tour players is to how much input you get from them because they're obviously the player but you're the guy on the outside looking in going i think this is the direction we need to go and you need to trust me yeah you know it's it that's it because it it can be i think it can be oil and water a lot of times i think the situation i think there's actually a huge opportunity there to work with tour players in a totally different light uh i think that too many uh teachers are trying to put their own stamp on the player and say well this is my player right you're yeah you're a lead better player so you're going to swing a swing or you're you know butch Harmon or whatever it happens to be you've got this certain style and i think there's a huge market to be able to go to a player or group of players and say listen i'm going to be in charge of your maintenance i'm not going to teach you anything new i'm going to just keep teaching you your swing yeah. just like jack grout did with, with nicholas back in the day Every year, Nicholas would go back at the start of the year and say, Jack, teach me my swing, mm-hmm. right? Start with grip, start with stance, start with ball position, right? And I think that was just brilliant, really, when you think about uh, that. But I think there's a huge market there for for tour players. I think there's way too many guys that get lost you know, in the wilderness, if you will, because all of a sudden you're changing. There's always one or two pieces that that tour player will not ever change. Right. For Mackenzie Hughes, he's got a very strong grip. He's had a strong grip from day one. Right. So as a result, for him to be able to hit cuts, he comes down at P5, P5.5 with a fair bit of extension as lead wrist. Mm-hmm. That's okay. We're creating the cut from his structure, you know, from his spine angle and his pelvic <laughs> angles. Um, so we had to kind of dance around that because that was just the one piece that he wasn't going to change. You know, for um, you know, for Eduardo, um, you know, again, there were some feels there that he wanted, you know, um, and a lot of times, getting getting that out of the player, I think, is is hard. Is is they don't know your you know our language very well. So, right. So as a result, they're going to talk in feels and sort of abstract ways that they understand. And I think it's our job to be able to sort of translate that and go, what's this guy really saying? And then be able to create some feels or some drills out of that are there some players and this has been a on a big de- big debate on facebook and social media about anatomical correct language and i sort of go back and forth because i think it depends on the player but how how much are you in favor of using the correct language with players you know flexion extension I, mean, I think some of the easier ones, those are definitely the wrist angles. I sure. think tend to be easier for players to understand. Sure. Um, when you start talking about external internal rotation, I think those get a little bit confusing to a player. I mean, how much do you, yeah, I think we have to be really careful with that because yeah. just throwing around the terminology, uh, for example, when you measure external rotation in the shoulder joint, it's actually in this plane of movement. So with my arm to my side, you know, this is external here, this is internal here. Mm -hmm. So by the time you start putting the elbow in front of you in a different position, you know, you can say it's moving toward external rotation, but is it really in external? And then again, is it back in internal, right? So if you really want to be to the book, to the letter of it, 
then that I think creates a whole big conundrum. Um, with the player, I don't like. There are some players certainly who are up on that sort of terminology. Yeah, let's they say, understand it, the let's say their golf IQ is pretty high. Right. Um, but there's other guys uh, that certainly they they'd run away if you heard that. I think that language is very useful when you and I have a conversation. Right. Yeah, coach to coach is right. It's just like definitely. two doctors walking down the hallway and say that that guy's got a radial fracture and his you know whatever. Yeah. Uh, and and being able to know exactly what that meant, exactly where it was, and that's like the whole P system and all the rest of this stuff. Sure. Yeah. Just just references. I agree. Yeah, I think metaphors are useful. That's why I use Absolutely. more, you know, I stole a bunch from Tyler and, sure. you know, and, and Joe Mayo and you know, the screwdriver and the motorcycle and, and, you know, and let them say, I usually get the feedback from the students say, Hey, how do you, yeah, how do you relate to this? Yeah. And a lot of times I'll just, I'll just actually move them the way I want them to move them right. and then let them describe there it to me Yeah, and say, well, what did that feel like? And if he goes, yeah, it kind of felt like I twisted it here. I'm like, yeah. okay, great. That's yeah. all we got to do. Okay, let's twist it there. And, yeah, and then and, call it back and say, this is your language, this is the way you right. relate. So Yeah, I think it's good. I think it's it's important. I think that some, some guys just like to sort of throw around the language to be flashy or whatever. But right. um, I think there's a useful, as I said, when, when we have conversations or they're on the forum and you've got a certain level of golf IQ there that you can relate to that. Yeah, I, I never heard any anything like that today in your lesson which i think was really cool no he just tell me to shut up <laughs> <laughs> you're like stop stop with the the technical ter- yeah, exactly. terminology just exactly. tell me what i need to do give just, me a drill exactly give me a drill <laughs> and why is my ball starting 10 feet right away yeah, yeah exactly. exactly so that's really cool the thing that i'm really curious about because you know i've followed you for a long time we've been friends and it's how you're creating speed is speed i think is is a very difficult thing to create in students especially average golfers sure and i i want to have a better answer for my players that want to get more speed and i think obviously the younger the player maybe there's more opportunity yeah but can you give us more specifics i know one one of your i'm looking at your your curriculum here again clubhead speed dynamics and the the four laws of club head speed. Yeah, there you can go. you elaborate on those for us? Absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we can thank, uh, you know, Phil Cheatham and, and Sasha McKenzie, forces and torques. Um, just a quick uh, history on that. So uh, maybe about six years ago or so, I, funny enough, on YouTube, I came across, uh, like, world championship axe chopping. Okay, it was like these guys that, you know, would take one one or two little, uh, you know, chops with the axe to, to go through this huge piece of wood. And I'm watching these guys with their action, and they're, the first thing that they're doing is they're getting way up on their toes and their backswing, if you will. And then they're dropping down, and they jump back up, and then they, you know, hit this thing with all their might and, uh, you know, hit it in one or two blows. And I was thinking, oh, that's kind of interesting. So the next day I went to uh, my winter school, and... I started to uh, I started to say, okay, well, what happens if I just kind of come up with my my body a little bit, and then I'm going to drop down around the top, and then I'm going to kind of stand up again at, around impact. And like, obviously, I got to build some rotation into that as well. But basically, right. I had this this sort this of this is the vertical force. Yeah, this is the center of mass yeah. dis- displacement, as we call it, going up and down. At the very first swing, I was six miles an hour faster, and I was like, holy shit! <laughs> like that was crazy. Right, wow. just crazy. Now yeah. the swing felt disgusting. Sure, but I uh, immediately I knew I was on to something. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew it worked. Right, so so I, I started to look at the timing. I started to slow down the video of these axe choppers, and I, I looked at the timing of where the uh, let's say the inertia of the axe was going, or where was the axe going relative to where their body center mass was going, and I noticed that the best axe choppers were basically the axe was still moving backward as their center of mass was started to move downward interesting okay so what that does which i learned from phil and and sasho is that creates a very large contralateral stretch okay so contralateral stretch just means you're stretching a muscle across your muscles stretch across the joints so when you contralateral stretch it you've got uh, pieces going in opposite direction that create a bigger stretch across the muscle. So if my if I stretch my pec and pull my arm behind me, you know I'm stretching my pec. But if I move my pec away at the same time, I create an even better stretch. 
So when the inertia of the axe going back combined with the center of mass going the opposite direction created multiple contralateral stretches all the way up the body. And so there was a timing window there. There was a window of opportunity. And when I did it right, and, you know, I said in two weeks, I, I gained about nine miles an hour. I mean, at 44 years old, I'm, I'm almost 10 miles an hour faster than I was at 24 years old. Wow. Um, it's not because I'm in better shape. Is yeah. that more, is you're, you're pointing at your trail, trail arm, is that more? No, 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 nothing there. Just, just all the way through with the way, timing of the, of, okay. the, of the inertia. And, and, you know, so that was my real uh, reason I went to see Phil and Sasho in, in uh, Scott. You wanted to know Scott's the answers reality. of why. I want to know why the hell this stuff worked, yeah. right? Because I was getting, at this point, I'd already started to teach it to other people. And it was working. But again, I didn't really know why it worked. So if somebody asked me, well, why does this work? I kind of knew this idea of the stretch, but I didn't really understand the laws of clubhead speed. So there's only four things that you can do. Okay, the first thing you can do is you can increase basically the length of the size of the hand path. So that's going to give you a better opportunity, okay, to so that's create power. The, the radius, are you saying? Well, the... just let's, let's call it a bigger circle. Okay. 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 So think of it as, uh, you know, being from Canada, you know, bigger toboggan hill. Okay. So if I want to go sledding and I want to go faster, I'm going to take the biggest hill possible, right? So same idea in the golf swing is if I've got that more time, if you will, or more space to create energy or put yeah, force Sasha into the club. Talk about that, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the low-hanging fruit. So we run programs at, at my club, at Hamilton Golf Country Club. We call them Swing Longer Clinics. And um, what the sort of a double meaning on that is that's a, a clinic designed for 75 and older for those members who are thinking about quitting because they're not hitting the ball anywhere now, right? They're hitting the driver 120 yards. They're just not happy people. Um, and we try and reestablish the length in their golf swing because that's the low-hanging fruit. That's the easy one. Because that doesn't take any more strength. That just gives, you know, we've got to add foot flare, you know, closed stances, yep. uh, narrow stances. Anything we can do to get their hips and shoulders to turn more, that's going to get that hand path to lengthen out a little bit. And, you know, it's been a huge success at the club because you've got, you know, your your, your GM at your club is going to be a real happy guy. Because obviously, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to keep the members you have than to try and attract new ones. And so it keeps those older players playing the game. and Because uh, I'll tell you, at that age, half the reason they play is they don't want to be the first guy to hit their second shot on par four. Right. Right. They want to come into the, the grill room after and go, hey, I drove Bob five times today. And they're all the ones that are keeping their trail leg flexed and hips trying well, to get the X factor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we won't get into that one. Right. Yeah. So that's law number one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Law number two is is the total amount of linear work that you're applying to the club. So linear is basically pushing and pulling on the handle. Okay. Um, and you know, in in um, some of Doctor Nesbitt's work, uh, you know, he I think it was two and a half times uh, the angular. So linear was much more powerful contrib contributor to club head speed. Uh, this is the big lie we've been sold in the industry for 100 years that lag was the secret to hit it far. Right. Uh, and what we're finding out now is the linear contributors are much more powerful than the angular ones. And if you look at Jason Day, you look at Rory McIlroy, you look at some of these players, there really isn't a lot of lag out there. Okay. And a lot of that, I think, is the golf ball being harder and doesn't spin as much. But. Um, Mackenzie, for example, when he underloads, like you saw him today, mm -hmm. uh, when he underloads uh, second accumulator uh, radial deviation, uh, he's three miles an hour faster than when he overloads it because he drives his pivot harder. Interesting. Because yeah. it's already out. Right. He, That's he, the cast pattern, actually, that right. most, a lot of tour players have, yeah. right? It's like Justin Thomas, yeah. Rory, they both toss it out first, mm -hmm. right? In Mackenzie, that's one of the patterns I, I teach is that constant radius underloaded two pattern because from there you can pivot really really fast mm -hmm. um and so he's faster because he's strong in his body but if you've got too much lag angle there you've got to stall the pivot to get it back out so you end up robbing peter to pay paul sometimes so like yeah the interesting thing there is, is so those first two the length of the hand path and and how much sort of work that you're applying to this um in a linear fashion and I say linear, but really that's in a curve, right? So if right. I if I rotate, that's actually technically a linear application to the handle. 
And that was far more powerful than the angular contributions. The third law is the amount of angle that I can create potentially, I say potentially here, the more degrees, I would say that's more beneficial when you're chipping and you're pitching. You know, we are getting, instead of a two and a half to one ratio, like you're in a full swing. You're showing radial deviation. Yeah, we're, we're probably going to have a listeners. little bit more in the chipping and pitching game right. in terms of you know the ratio. It's I don't think it's one to one, but it's a little closer to one to one. Sure. Um, so there is some speed that's being produced because you're, you're, you're moving that shaft through, let's say, a, a 60 or 70 degree hinge angle. Um, and, and technically, there's speed there. Okay. And then the last one is how hard can you uncock that? So those are the four laws. You've got the length of the hand path, how much linear work you're applying, uh, how much sort of movement, if you will, of the club around its center of mass. And that's a tricky one because that's not yeah. really, it is the wrists. But the wrists are both linear and angular because you're actually moving the club around its center of mass. And to do that is is not purely here. Okay, so... Um, and then lastly is, is how hard you can kind of snap that shot, if you will. So if you look at the long drivers and you look at Jamie Sadlowski, you look at some of these guys, they have all four, right? The guys that are trying to hit 400 yards mm -hmm. had better make use of all four of those. So the linear contributors, this is where it gets interesting. So that's where the center of mass displacement. So a few years ago, there's a paper out there. I, I've been trying to find it. I read it once, and it compared Jim Furyk and Rory McIlroy. And I found it very interesting because both have sort of a punch elbow type uh, release into the golf ball. Yeah. Um, Jim Furyk, 6'3", 200 pounds. Rory at the time was like 165 pounds, you know, five foot eight. And what they found was they just simply tracked club head speed. And they said, well, Jim Furyk at the top of his swing, his club's moving 15 miles an hour. He's got that loop. It actually never stops. Uh, around P6, halfway down, it's moving 48 miles an hour. From there, you know, the, the combination of both linear and angular from P6 jumped it up another 60 miles an hour to 108 miles an hour with the driver. Rory, on the other hand, was basically zero at the top of his golf swing. But halfway down, he was 64 miles an hour. Wow. Now, funny enough, only gained 60, just like Jim Furyk, between P6 and impact. So the difference was in the first half of the downswing, not the second half, right? Right. So what was Rory doing that Jim does not do? And that's the center of mass displacement. So Rory almost has two and a half inches of sort of center of mass drop from P4 Okay, just before P4. You're he talking about dropping. the body or the club? Body the body, mass. right. Sorry, yeah, yeah. body center yeah. mass. Yeah, he, he drops out about two and That's the two squat and sort of look. You call that unweighting, call yeah, it squatting. Yeah, right. I mean, it's, it's sort of synonymous, but sure. he basically drops very violently, very quickly. And, and that's then, the, the wood chopper getting ready to go back up, right? Correct. Yeah. And then he slams the ground and jumps back up. Gotcha. Right. But that motion that. You know, it wasn't gravity, but the fact that he's dropping so quickly is pumping a huge amount of linear speed to this. And the analogy I like to use is your golf swing is exactly like a boat. So if you've got a boat and it's going the wrong way and you're trying to sort of back into its spot at, at, the, uh, at the dock, you know, the hardest thing to do is to get the boat to actually start moving in the first place. Once it starts moving, it's actually easy to move, Okay. So there's a whole lot of energy in your golf swing that's used up trying to simply change direction. Now, if I use gravity to do it for me, then I've got all that muscular contraction still left. But if I'm using the muscular contraction to try and change direction, it's once it's fired, once it's used, it's kind of gone. So that's the difference between Jim Furyk at 108 and Roy at 124. So how do you... <clears throat> that's a great... A great segue into like how do you teach transition like you know for our let's talk about our club players mm -hmm. right because these for the teachers out there we're all trying to get people to shallow it out and there's 25 different ways that we're trying to get that accomplished what are some of the things that you go to and i know there's different ways for different players you know how are we getting the sweet spot behind the hand path how are we getting the pivot to ignition you know how, how do you do that how do you explain it to well, it depends. You're, you're right. There's a lot of ways to do it. But I, I think that, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of players that know they need to do that and they're trying to manufacture it. And really, it's it's more a product of actually rotation, uh, anterior pelvic tilt, 
Okay, so pushing the hips backward around P3 and a half. Um, uh, also having a deep enough uh, lead arm that's not floating out too much at P3. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when that left arm is a little more connected, if you will, and then the body goes into anterior pelvic tilt around P3 and a half, what that does is that actually forces the hand path out a smidgen. So once it goes out a hair, then the center of mass, as it continues to hinge at the top, ends up being tossed behind the hand path. So me going into anterior pelvic tilt pulls the hand path forward, me allowing that last six inches of load, if you will, maybe a touch of wrist there, allows that sweet spot then to get behind it. So what about the guy, the players that are, the, the hand path's going out, but the shaft is steepening in the... We get that negative beta. Yeah, usually we don't want. at your club pro level, Le or club lead, player lead level. Wrist is, is radial because yeah. they want to have lag, and then the yeah. club head's like so out of position, they're going to yeah. shank it or wipe it. So usually those players get disconnected at P3 with their lead arm. So there's too much space here. Then they add a pivot to it. As they add the pivot, they actually go posterior with their pelvis mm -hmm. instead of anterior. So now they're hunched. They're already starting to extend. As they get to the top, then then you know they're trying to pull this thing down. Hand so, path's not deep enough. Right. Yeah. So then they they sort of pull the hand path in instead of out, and then the the center mass actually kicks the other way, kicks into positive, mm -hmm. and that's where you know Sasha tested 100 tour players. I think 98 or 99 of them had a little bit of that that negative beta, that little bit of off plane movement in transition. Uh, obviously, some players had different amounts, sure. but they, they almost all did it. So I think that is a teachable piece and an important piece for our, for, our, for our members. The problem with our members is most of them lack external rotation, their trail arm capabilities. Yeah. They also lack sometimes internal rotation, their lead arm. That one's not talked about, but when yeah. this goes this way, this one's going this way. Expand on that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So your lead arm going back is actually going to feel like it's externally rotated mm -hmm. if it's deep. Yeah. Okay. So the elbow's pointing down more. Correct. Yep. Just As it goes up the chest. Yeah. Okay. And I go into anterior pelvic tilt that actually pushes this into internal rotation. Supinates the lead. Right. Or, yeah. Call that number three. Call yep. it supination. Call yep. it. Call it a ton. Also at the same time, well now that trail arm also goes maybe into a bit of external. So so both arms contribute to this, but everybody likes to talk about this guy and nobody's talking about the left arm. So the way you load that left arm, it's very interesting. If you take your left arm and put it palm up and, and put it tight against your chest and, and sort of try and run it up your chest, there comes a point where you can't go any farther. Mm -hmm. To go any farther, you'll notice if you go a little farther, you have to rotate it that way. That releases the pressure on the shoulder. Uh -huh. Okay. So it's a very interesting sort of mechanism that you can get a player to sort of feel, we'll call this under, mm -hmm. at P3, keep going up a little bit, push their butt out a little bit, and you'll start to see this thing actually shallow out. Yeah, and I, I do that a lot with because I'm a big believer, and you can tell me this is crap, or, but I've just seen it so much, is the, the position of the shaft at the top of the backswing, I think, influences transition and club path like i'm seeing more people that i guess supinate the lead forearm club real laid off and open it could be the face obviously sure and they're yeah. going to tend to tip it out coming down 100 percent. and when yeah. you get them straighter or even across the line a touch that's easier for them to shallow it out yeah and without I, having to do a whole lot of yeah conscious I'd, thought uh, i'd agree with that i think for a lot of our club golfers across the line is a great place for them yeah i try to push um, them as much as i yeah, can towards I mean, that from there, they, they've got all the time in the world to kind of get that feeling. So it's, that's that hand path, curve, timing. Yeah. It's kind of like your Freddie Couples model, right? right? Like, you know, if they, maybe not with such a high elbow, but if they get yeah. it a little bit deeper and across, yeah. um, they already generally rotate, you know, they, they lack this, the, uh, the coordination, the separation between their thorax and their pelvis, right, as club golfers. They just don't have the flexibility between here and here. Right. So as a result, when they turn, everything turns. Right, yeah. So that's going to throw that hand path way out. So I better start with that club way over here so that when the hand path goes out, that the head goes in. And, I mean, it's a great way, I think, for a lot of the club golfers. Now, your really flexible juniors like your son or somebody yeah. like that uh, might be a more dangerous place for them to play from. Sure, they'll get uh, it underneath real quick. Yeah, just they're so fast and so flexible that that uh, and they have the capability to separate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's uh, so important. This is great. This is good stuff, man.
<laughs> you may you may not make it home. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. This is good. All right. So if you were, and it will kind of go into some of the, I know you're very well read, obviously, and, and, and have some good book ideas, but if you were teaching a class to young coaches, because I, I want to give the advice to the young coaches, what would that curriculum look like? And then what would your reading list include? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, as much as we live in a world of social media and it's, it's good that and certainly you use it, I use it um, to sort of promote our brands, if you will. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it comes down to fixing people, right? And, and you've got to be really good at that. And, 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 you know, you've got to be so good at it that, that people from all over the place want to come and see you, right? Because um, you can correct that. So all the time you're looking to improve your skills of diagnosis, uh, improve your skills of, you know, understanding anatomy, understanding some of the f- underlying forces and torques. Um, like in my certification, again, we try and present it in different ways to different people mm-hmm. so that, um, again, doesn't mean we use that language with our students. Absolutely not. But each instructor should understand that there's different ways of looking at golf swings. You can look at it purely from a geometric standpoint. You can look at it purely from the, the dynamics and the biomechanics or the anatomy. Um, or you can look at it as both. And, and I think it's important for, for young teachers to um, keep pushing themselves to learn more and more and more. And it's, it's only going to make it easier. Um, I mean, I've been blessed you know, teaching for about 25 years now. And, and, uh, across that time, I look at it now and I, I still produced good players back in the day when I didn't know very much at all. It just took me a heck of a lot longer. Right. And, uh, I would say that's the biggest thing. Knowing what I know now allows me to make much faster changes with players and being a more effective teacher. And that's, that's going to fill the lesson book, right? If some guy goes, Hey, I can take one lesson with Scott and I'm going to get more out of that than five lessons with somebody else. Um, it's actually a deal for them. You sure. Know? So uh, I would encourage you know the young teachers for sure learn up on anatomy, understand the language, you know, talk, mentor, you know, go watch good coaches coach. Um, you know, sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes you'll see it's it's a pretty boring lesson. It's very, you know, just little tidbits of information, especially with with good players. Right. Um, you know, it's. It's, it's, I mean, I'm blessed. I mean, I, I got the greatest job, I think, in the world, and, and I love helping people. And I think that's the other thing, too, is, is, is at some point you're going to put in a lot of hours and you're probably not going to get paid a lot of money, but it's all going to be worth it in the end because you're going to develop these skills that you're going to be able to apply uh, at a later date and, and, you know, be a real sort of samurai, if you will, with the, with the lesson tee. Be willing to work for free, right, a lot of times. That's, that's my advice a lot of times yeah. to the kids is get in there. Yeah, get the experience, right. get, get in there, learn some stuff. And, and uh, I mean, the second that you think you know anything, slap yourself in the head because, you <laughs> yes. know, we're all looking, we're all researching more and we're all trying to learn more. And, and uh, again, you just have to have a filter and understand, well, you know, I look at all that information or the posts or the stuff that, that Dr. Kwan or, or Sasha or whoever posts, I look at it and I go, well, does that influence what I do? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting. Yes. And, and, and maybe I can learn something in this, you know, and I, I loved it. You know, Coach Camp UK, uh, it was, uh, Andrew Rice invited me uh, as one of the presenters last year in, in London. And it was myself and, and David Orr and uh, Andrew and Chuck Cook. And uh, loved it. You know, Chuck Cook stood up at the start of the presentation. He said, all the people in the room just want to let you know. You know, some of you kind of bash the golfing machine, but I want to tell you, I've made $8 million teaching the golfing machine. At which point you can kind of drop a pin in the room, right? And, you know, he makes a very good point, right? So yeah. you could argue that some of the book is wrong and some of the terminology is wrong or some of the descriptions. But in 1969, they didn't have anything better than that. Just like in ni- or 2018, we're going to look back at this date and go, you guys didn't know anything in 2018. Right. Right, because in 2038, you're, you're going to look at it and say, "Yeah, we." I'm going to be Chuck Cook. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I hope so. I <laughs> right? hope I hope I'm Chuck. That's Cook, my guy. Right? Like, I, I would love that. That guy is just amazing. But you know, he's he's taken this and said, "You know what? I've taken the principles that I've learned from us, put my own obviously spin on it, and and had a very successful career." 
Well, it shows you the other side of teaching, right? And coaching the, the EQ part. Yeah. He didn't, he wasn't beating guys against, you know, over the head with it. Yeah. He, he, he understood coaching. Yeah. hundred percent. And how to communicate whatever that information was, which is going to make people better. Yeah. And if you got to tell, you know, if you got to get that student thinking about pink elephants when they swing, cause they hit it good when they think about pink elephants, then that's the best lesson that they're going to get. That's right. And, and at the end of the day, you know, that's, we're not saving lives. We're not. We're not brain surgeons here. We're we're trying to help people enjoy the game of golf. Whether it's a tour player trying to play better, uh, you know, produce better scores, or your club golfer, obviously, just trying to get the ball airborne. Um, and I, I think sometimes we maybe make it bigger than it actually is, if that makes sense. You know, that it is life and death, and it's like no, it's, it's golf not. exactly. It's golf. So what's our what's our reading list look like? Reading list, wow. Well, if you could ever get your hands on any, any of Max stuff, that would be good. Uh, I've got a, one paper. Yeah, that's a it's good start. It's in my file. There you go. That's a good start. One, like a fade pattern. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's the 1991? Yep. Yeah, I got that one. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, um, you know, I think it's actually beneficial beneficial for players to go through Stack and Tilt. I really think it's it's good to go to a school and, yeah. and, and see what they're presenting and uh, – you know, I think it's important for them to, uh, um, you know, read. You can go online, read every paper that Sasho has done is listed for free online at uh, SaintFX.ca uh, um, in in Nova Scotia, where he is. And uh, you know, I've talked to Sasho many times for hours on the phone, and he's very been very very giving with his time. And um, I found that you know just to sort of kibitz and have these little powwows like you do uh, in the dojo there mm-hmm. where you you'll bring in people and you'll you'll kind of brainstorm for a day or two right i think it's fantastic you know it gets guys minds working gets gets different perspectives going it's interesting to listen to how other other people sort of maybe interpret the same the same thing um the the problem i think with books in this day and age to be honest with you, is that it's too slow Right. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. social media and the internet, like it's, it's, it's already like six months ahead before the book even comes out. It's amazing that, yeah, the kids, the kids nowadays, I, I get, I got to remind myself because they're learning so much faster oh, way than faster. we did. Yeah. So we're like going, hold on now. But I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's a different generation. Yeah. They're, they're not reading as much to listen to audio books or listen to podcasts. Yeah. You know, and, and looking at YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the biggest thing, and I, I've seen this a lot with some of the younger teachers, is, is that, you know, don't drink the Kool-Aid with one thing. Right. You know, don't don't pigeonhole yourself into one thing. You know, Great be advice. versatile. Yep. You know, understand that everybody that comes through your door isn't going to need uh, a square peg in a round hole. You know, some sometimes it's going to take something different. And, and you need, you need to be better to be able to, like I did with Eduardo, you have to be able to adapt to the player, um, sometimes, even though it may run counter to your preferences. I think it's important even with, with some of your club players, not to force them. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that the average junior that I see develop from, let's say age 12 to 17 probably goes through at least three patterns in the swing. Yeah, I would agree. Just because of puberty, because of yeah. you, don't, you don't know where they're ending up. You don't know what their needs are going to be. Do I need to hit it further? Do I need to hit it straighter? I've got one living under my roof right now. 100%. 100%. <laughs> it, it, I've learned a lot in the last year and a half that's going to help me yeah. help my juniors in the future. Yeah. So I, I, sure. I think, you know, reading online, participating in some of the forums, um, you know, listening, you know, the old line about saying, you know, you listen with your ears, not your mouth. And, and, uh, um, I really learned a lot talking uh, to Chuck in in London and and just about kind of life in general and some of the things that he's done. Do you remember some stories that he that he told you? Can uh, you know just just basically you know I love what he does. I'd love to get my career to this point. I mean Chuck doesn't charge any of his college kids or his juniors a cent. Wow, doesn't charge them a cent now. A little caveat on that is that, you know, Chuck also was, I think, one of the very early investors in Yahoo. So <laughs> he's I think, okay. Yeah, Chuck's doing he's, all right. He's doing so okay. He's doing all right. But <laughs> he does say that when those players make it to the PGA Tour, that they're going to get a big fat bill. Yeah. And, you know, and if or you, they should be willing to. Yeah. And most start of those paying. players, certainly, if they make it to the PGA Tour, are going to be willing to. They should show some gratitude. To pay that bill, right? Yeah. So it kind of creates a very cool environment because 
all the time at his facility at uh, University of Texas, um, you know, there's all these great players hanging around. So it just becomes this whole mecca of great players, and they're you know they're they're chipping and putting against each other. There's contests going, you know, and he's in there teaching. You know, he's he's kind of running the show. It's sort of this whole uh, kind of circus, and I, I think that's beautiful. I mean, yeah. I'd, lo- I'd love to be able to get there in my career and 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 be able to do that. You know, teach yeah, teach the people you want to teach, um, and and <laughs> and be able to you know help the ones that need it the most and mm-hmm. and you know payment is an option you know it's just kind of a cool thing that was really cool who who have been some of your mentors throughout the years i know you mentioned a few people but it doesn't have to be golf but like life uh, anything yeah. anybody early on that pushed you in a direction or uh, you know what, probably lessons? my uh probably my first boss as an assistant you know a guy named david main who was uh well later on he's now a, a gm uh funny enough at a tennis club but anyways he's <laughs> he's he's been in our association been president of our association and, and so on uh he's all, still a pga professional though and uh you know he kind of told me very early on that he, he kind of believed in me basically he said you know you can do whatever you want and i see someday that you're going to be the the David Ledbetter of Canada. Now this is back in the nineties when obviously uh, Led was sort of the number one guy in the sure. world. And it's a big compliment. Yeah, he said, you know what, you can do it. And and he was just very, um, you know, that not that I, I lack self esteem or anything, but he, he kind of showed me that if I did the right things and I and I, I sort of built it up and I just kept making people better and and um, the, that good things would happen and. Uh, from there, you know, honestly, my wife, uh, she was also a golf professional, and uh, or was. She's, you know, she doesn't uh, work in the industry now uh, with two two kids at home. But uh, um, she's always been the same way. She's been very, um, yeah, just helped me all the way through. And and uh, you know, still the hardest working golf pro I've ever seen is, is my wife for sure. And uh, she's the head of the mastermind crew. Yeah, exactly. You got to have that support. Yeah. And that support system just allows me to, to come down and, and do all these things. And, and uh, you know, she's been really great um, with that support level. So I think those two people in, in particular, and then, you know, there's certainly others uh, in the industry, some of the older pros back in Canada, who I talked to, Rob McDonald, who's who's the guy that hired me at Hamilton 12 years ago, and uh, you know he was kind of the same way. And he said, "Well, you know, show me what you're going to do." And and you know I wrote a proposal down for him, and he said, "Well, sounds good, but I want more of this, 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 and this." And I said, "Okay." And uh, I just said about creating sort of what I could be the best sort of private club academy in the country, and and uh, you know he had the had the uh, trust if you will that i was going to do a good job and and uh, so it's been been great and then certainly the membership at, at hamilton is is wonderful too where where i work and is that primary. a private club yeah, yeah. We, we've got the canadian open again next year in, in nice. june and uh, it's an old harry colt design and uh, beautiful club and uh you know they they've been great uh, to me over the last 12 years there for sure describe a failure like you know i know it's not all it's not all uh, an uphill battle or a downhill battle i guess that maybe turned out to help your career or give you a boost or you know i know we we learn more from our failures than we do our successes a lot of times is there some some failure you can describe that maybe made an impression on your career now that you look back uh, yeah, you know, certainly earlier on in my career, for sure, I, I would say that there were, you know, like all of us, we've, we've probably hurt some of our players, you know, because our preferences uh, got in the way, you know, instead of helping that player and what they needed, we tried to fit them into the box that we sort of envisioned for them. And I think over the years, you know, and that's multiple times, that's not one time. And uh I think over the years, I think I've just gotten better at recognizing that, you know, that's not really the right way. And, and, and working with Grant, you know, and Grant told me the one day, I remember he said, you know, I like the power I'm getting, but I, I don't like the way it looks, and I don't feel like I have the control. And I kind of thought to him, I was like, well, wait a minute, but in my world, this, this biomechanics is better. It's got to be better, right? Right. And so I recognized at that point that, well, maybe 
maybe I was approaching this all wrong is, is I have to approach this and say, what does this player need? Not what is my preference and even sometimes not even what is the player's preference, but let's, let's get some statistical data. Let's actually outline this and see what does this player actually need to do to play better golf, right? For example, if you've got, um, you know, Mackenzie Hughes, uh, we'll call him a plotter. Okay. I mean, Mackenzie likes to hit fairways, you know, he, you know, hits a lot of greens hopefully. And, and then, um, this past year didn't putt as well, but two years ago was eighth on tour and putting, let the putter do the talking, you know, had a great season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, his demands are, he needs to hit the fairway primarily. He needs to make sure that his iron game, he's missing on the correct sides of the, of the hole, like we we're doing today with right. some of those drills. Um, and then from there, just, just putt, you know, trust his putter. On the flip side, if you've got a bomber, you know, the bomber doesn't have to hit it straight. He just has to hit it far enough and, and not create penalty strokes, you know, and the rough is usually okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but they need to be a lot better with short game trouble shots or short, short-sided trouble shots because they're aiming at more pins, right? They're closer to the pin. They're aiming at more pins, but that means their misses have got, you know, they've got buried lies under the bunker, you know, short little flop shots, stuff like that that's very tight around the green. Mm-hmm. So those are their strengths right and and so a lot of my sort of mini tour players that are trying to get to the next level need to recognize their brand of golf and maybe they don't even know what their brand of golf is and and i think that was something that came from working with grant and maybe a little bit later on with eduardo is sometimes my preferences aren't right sometimes even the players preferences aren't right and and the best solution is to figure out what does that player actually need so you need to have some good, you know, statistical data. You need to be able sure. to figure out how they like to play. Um, I think there's 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 room there for. I, I can see in twenty years the skill sets are so good now, on tour that the only thing is it's going to be a massive chess game. It's going to be the guy that understands the odds and understands on Sunday afternoon on the back nine that this is the time on hole number 15 to try and hit that seven iron close because all all week long you've been hitting it 20 feet right of the pin into the five of the green and this time we're going to go right at it and that might be the difference between winning the tournament and not and and i think we're at a point that we've got so many good coaches out there so many great athletes out there uh the scores keep going down and down and down to a certain extent you know maybe not the winning score necessarily but i would say you, know, you look at this past week you know, winning score was 20 under, but how many guys were 15 under and better? Ton. Tons, yeah. right? So it's not like one or two guys are at 20 under, and the rest are back at 10 under. Um, all these guys are playing so good. So it just becomes the player. It's almost like playing uh, playing poker or playing uh, blackjack. And you know, when do I double down? Right? And <laughs> And that information, that's the cool thing. There's stuff coming out now. Um... You like the decade system? If you're, I, I do you like Scott. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah, done, I've done I like, some work with Scott. I think yeah. it's really good info. Fantastic. I yeah. mean, because most people have no idea. Right. Right. So I think it's it's fantastic, and uh, for people to understand their misses, understand the patterns of misses, um, and understand that you know it, it's like they said, it's 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 a shotgun. It's not a sniper. Right. It's sniper probability. Game. You know, it's a it's a game 100%. like that game like theory that he that he encompasses. I think that's. In the, it's a long game. Yeah, hundred percent. Right, it's 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 the long run you're gonna win. Yeah, if you do this. Yeah, if you I have mean, the patience and the, <laughs> the patience. That's right. the thing, right? I mean, it, that's why I think Tiger's been so good for so long. From what Scott talks about, you know, and he obviously is internally somehow figured that out. Yeah, yeah, Phil too, right? I think Phil's a great thinker, you know, and especially with his iron game, you know, like mm-hmm. he he controls the distance extremely well. Hits, you know, hits into the right side of the pins, give himself the best opportunities, yet at the same time sort of minimizes the mistake for the most part. And, and uh, you know, I think Jordan Spieth's fantastic at that. Yeah. Um, and I think some guys gravitate it, but I think more and more players are going to have to learn to do that and, and understand their misses so completely that on the flip side, I think that there's players that maybe play too conservative because they think their misses are actually wider than they actually are. Right, so maybe mm-hmm. maybe there's a difference instead coming into that back nine on Sunday that instead of aiming 20 feet to the right, I aim 10 or 15 feet because my average miss with that seven iron is whatever 25 feet. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but maybe I tighten it up at that point in time. And it's just knowing when do I do that, right? And and maybe, you know, maybe that's not possible. But I th- I think you'll see that as time goes by, you'll continue to see these these great scores, these great athletes. They're all going to hit it far. They're all going to you know strokes gain it won't be like it is now with rory being so so much better than everybody else off you know td green you're gonna see everybody really good start catching up yeah yeah and i think that's one of the reasons why you see just like 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 even tiger like tiger's game is pretty darn good now Mm -hmm. and he's not dominating no right it's just there's too many good players right right and same with rory like when rory you know 2012 2013 was driving the way he does now it was this massive advantage, but there's other guys out there that are doing the same thing. Tony Finau is impressive. Yeah, yes. DJ, DJ's obviously impressive. There's other guys that are playing the same game that Rory is, so he's not gonna. You know, I think that's part of the frustration probably for Rory is that he could kind of do what he did five years ago and win. Yeah, and with now, a mediocre putting day or and now he can't do it. Yeah, he can't do it. He has to putt better. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, but I think you know if if we look at at. Um, the biggest lesson I've learned is, is, is try to, to make the decisions not with your own ego, your own preferences, but really try and, and, and help the player first. And and they may not know how to help themselves. Yeah, right? that's, that's the hard part about our job mm-hmm. is figuring out when we need to assert our you know ideas yeah. or we need to defer to the player like Eduardo. I mean, that's a great, 100%. like, I don't know that I could have done that. And I'd have yeah. lost them. I mean, they'd yeah. be like, okay, see you later. Well, and, and to be truthful, it came to that point where yeah. I was either going to lose him as a client yeah. or, uh, you know, we, we had to find out another way, right? Because he wasn't happy with with that one part of it. And I didn't, sure. you know, I had to adapt to him at that point. And I think that, um, you know, when we, I think one of the reasons I enjoy working with developing players is probably because I can put my stamp on a little bit more. But then when you step into that higher arena with the tour players, if you will, like there's already things in there that you just can't really touch. Sure. And it's, it's kind of like, I, you know, I always say like the secret to Butch Harmon's success is, is how do I make this player better without changing them? Yeah. Such a great coach. Right. He's a brilliant, he's a brilliant coach, Absolutely. right? For motivation, for DJ, you slap him on the ass, kick, and him, say, yeah, kick go, him in the butt, so you got to practice. Go, harder. go hit some wedges, right? Like, right. like practice. And those he's wedges. got that presence already because there's reputation that they listen. Hundred percent. You know, and that's that's, that's what we're all trying to get. Yeah, everybody <laughs> wants to hear about Ben Hogan at the dinner table, right? Like it's, yeah. it's I mean, they eat that stuff up. <laughs> that's right. What what tactic what tactics do you use when you get stressed, when you get overwhelmed? Any anything you go to and anything that sort you of gives you relief in, in a lesson aside from the wine that we're drinking. Yeah, I was gonna say that's that, that's a good one. That's yeah, a good one. no, like in life, like you know, you you get you know we get busy and things you know, pile up, and then you know, well, how do you how do you deal with that? I find funny enough that, and and every once in a while, my wife will kick me out and she'll say, "Go to the golf course and hit some golf balls." Yeah, you, you seem to like to practice. Yeah, I like practice. You know, I like. You know, you still swing it pretty well, yeah, by the way. Some some days, some days. <laughs> but you know, at this time in my career, you know, I, I I like to play a little bit if I can. But I mean, it's not quite as important as it once was. And and uh, but I do love hitting balls. I do love uh, working on my own game, and that's kind of my happy place, if you will. You know, okay. where I can just go to the back of the range under the trees and and uh, you know just hit balls for not that much time, maybe even half an hour, but just. Everybody wants to feel a little bit of hope, you know what I mean? So even just to go back there, hit a few good solid shots, like, okay, I got this, I got it, I got it, right? And just, just to have something to carry you on to the next round or whatever. But uh, I would say for sure, I mean, uh, I'm not that complicated. I don't, you know, I don't climb mountains or anything crazy and, you know. Go I run like, marathons like me. No, no, I can't. I can't <laughs> go for a 15 mile no, run to clear my head. No, I can't run like that. I'd, I'd be dead after 15 feet, but the... Uh, I do like to hit golf balls, you know, I do like to, uh, you know, now that my kids are a little bit older and they're starting to get into the game. I was going to, I was going to ask you, are they playing? Are you got them in playing a little bit? A little or? bit. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're nine and six. So, uh, you know, my older one, she's, she's really great with, uh, the lessons I can give her something to work on or I could leave her for half an hour. She'd, she'd be happy as a clam hitting balls. Uh, my little one, she's a bit of a hellion and, 
and uh, she's really strong. Uh, she hits it almost as far as her older sister already. Um, and, you know, she's got to be sort of watched a little bit. But it, it's a great, you know, my dream certainly would be, you know, my foursome is to play with my wife and, and my, my two daughters and, and, and have a grand old time. So I'm looking forward to that the next couple of years. It's when the I, best. When get a little bit older, yeah. We did. We went through a, st- a stretch for my daughter. I got a, my daughter's two years older than Nick. Okay. And she played for a, for a little while, and then nice. we all, my wife played, so it was some good times for a few months yeah, there. Yeah, just, just a special, special moments, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's very cool. So in the last five years, what habit or behavior has improved your life the most? Uh, more than anything else, my, my brother does, um, media and marketing for about 35 different golf courses in North America. He does all of abandoned dunes, uh, and, uh, a lot of the private clubs in Canada. Um, and you know, he's sort of a self made kind of guy, if you will. Like he still, uh, runs his office out of his home. Um, you know, he's got some business partners that he deals with, but you know, he's kept everything kind of small, but sort of big at the same time. And, you know, I've learned a lot, I guess, from him in terms of, you know, just dabbling in some of these things. You know, my online presence, the certification stuff, like that, that all kind of landed on my lap. It wasn't something I designed or tried to do. It's just that people ask me, hey, would you would you think about doing this? And I was like, all right. And then, you know, with a little bit of advice from my brother on, on some of, 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 of how to deal with some of those online things and uh, he's well versed in that kind of end of it. Um, you know, it's it's been a great uh, a great success for me. It definitely gives you the exposure, as you know, and and yep. uh, you know it's good to share. You know, I tell all my juniors it's it's great to share their swings and, and get noticed by college coaches. I've got something like twenty six or twenty seven different college coaches that follow me on Instagram, and and uh, you know they're they're every once in a while I get an inquiry about one of my players or. Um, it's it's been great exposure for me as as well as my club as right. well as as well as the player so um but he kind of pushed me into it a little bit and said hey you know i i think you got to go this way and um it's sort of taken off and i'm enjoying the ride so far have you learned any new skills like have you have when's the last time you've become the beginner in anything have you learned anything new in the last few years I would say I'm getting to be a better traveler. It's so difficult, you right? Know, you know, the first few times <laughs> I, I mess that up or I, I, you know, I create a travel schedule that was a little too aggressive, not enough time. Um, I, I'm, I'm still learning. I've got uh, to go to Sweden next month, and, and uh, I've jammed a lot in, into sort of five, six days. But, you know, just trying to travel better and, and, and sort of, book things better and then right just be better be be more prepared i guess would be you know getting all those little uh dots crossed um uh, i've really learned a lot that way the first couple times it's just a disaster and uh, you know i'd forget you know my toothbrush or something yeah i'm the worst <laughs> and uh but no it's, <laughs> it's been a lot better and 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 you know my wife's a great organizer so she she kind of helps me out a little bit at time to time with that but um it's besides that you know to be honest with it i haven't had a lot of time i mean i play guitar so every once in a while i'll I'll, uh chill on my guitar and just kind of you know kind of self-taught there and just kind of plunk away but you know those are special moments if i get you know a little bit of time here yeah that's cool that's been yeah one of the most probably the biggest answer i've gotten is a musical instrument people are people are trying to learn it's just interesting, I'm sure. I mean, this for me, it's podcasting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> figuring exactly. all this stuff out, right, yeah. and then trying to do do all the the editing and whatnot. So that's been my skill. But uh, learning, you know, being in in that sort of role of the beginner, I think, opens your eyes to what you're trying to what, do what we're players. trying to do with our players. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good it's a good wake up call. Yeah, I think I think too many times, you know, we're all guilty of sort of assuming either a certain golf IQ or assuming a certain skill. Yes. set where you know to be honest with you a lot of our players can't really feel their elbow from their kneecap if you will and and right. uh, uh i think it's it's a good thing you know a couple of years ago I, I i played around left-handed for a while you know that's just, a good one yeah yeah just to try and get the same sensations and see if i could build a swing that was any good 
you know, uh, left-handed based on what I what I was doing, and it was kind of fun. It was it was frustrating too. Yeah, so, there you go. Yeah, it was it was it was kind of a, a real eye opener for sure. If you had to get one message to the world or to two billions of people and put it on a billboard, what would it be? A quote or a saying? Anything? I would say I would say the biggest thing is is that. Um, I think life in general, the world in general, tends to hold hold us all back. And I think that anybody can pretty much do anything. Um, you know, it takes willpower, obviously a lot of hard work, a lot of a lot of tears, a lot of uh, sweat for sure. But um, I think that most golfers limit their own capability. It drives me nuts when somebody comes on my tee and says, hey, I'm a 12 handicap, I'd love to be a 9. And I'll say to them, I want you to be a scratch. Why are you why are you stopping at nine? Right, and they kind of go, oh, I'm I'm just I'll never be that good a golfer. I'm like, well, yeah, you're right because you just told yourself you're never going to be that good a golfer. Like let's like let's create some dreams here. Let's 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 work toward it. And and I found that you know if you can do that, and and sort of instill the the positivity, if you will, that hey, if you work hard enough and we create this game plan, there's there's no stopping you. You can be just about as good as you want to be. And um, I think limiting ourselves, you know, what's that line about the, uh, you know, the worst prisons are the ones that you build yourself. That's right. Right. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I, I think that people in general get just lulled into this, hey, I'll never make it. I'll never be uh, anything. And, and society kind of pushes them that way a little bit. And, I, and I'd love to have everyone just realize that, hey, I'm kind of limitless, you know, if I if I put my mind to it. And um, I think that was a, a big one for me, but also uh, I've been happy to, like yourself, mentor some of the younger pros and trying to get them to recognize that. Yeah, be better. Be better. Be better right? than us. Absolutely. That's what we're, that's what we're trying yeah. to do, leave the legacy. 100%. You know, stand on the shoulders of giants kind of thing, right? That's and right. Ju- and just keep doing that and, and keep promoting that. I mean, I love it uh, when, when one of my old students or one of my old, uh, you know, pros or coaches comes back and says hey you know i got this great new job and you know, i'm saying yeah you, you i knew you could do it that's what it's all about yeah for sure it's fun it's what gets me out of bed in the morning yeah it's good you've got a nice you've got a nice list of alumni for sure i appreciate it I mean, this has been fantastic i mean that's a that's a great way to close tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you and give them your contact you know your platforms your social media and yep. how they can say thank you and you can find me on uh, Instagram, uh, lots of posts there, um, at Scott Coke Certified, uh, as well as uh, Facebook and Twitter. Um, Scott at scottcokesgolf.com if you want to send me a message or send me an email. And um, yeah, right now we're, we're just having a lot of fun, uh, keep building great players and and uh, doing some of these uh, instructor certifications. Yeah, all, you're building all great place. instructors. That's the cool thing. Well, we're trying, and I think it's it's been uh, it's been sort of a needed part of the market that you know we're, I'm not trying to promote a certain style or a certain way of doing it. I'm just trying to lay out the pieces and then let you assemble whatever you want. I love that. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing this. Hey, thanks for having me on, pal. It's been fantastic. What's up, everybody? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you go. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. A big shout out to Scott Cox. I mean, that was a fantastic interview, and I hope you got a lot out of it, as I know I did. As usual, tweet me your biggest takeaway from this interview from Scott, and don't be afraid to reach out to him and say thank you. You can reach him on the Twitter at Scott Cox Goff or on Instagram at the same handle. You can reach myself at Golf Guru TV on Twitter and Instagram or hit both of us up on the Book of Faces uh, and we will friend you up as well. Don't forget to send in your questions to hashtag Guru Friday where I answer all your teaching and coaching questions. You can send the, your questions into golfgurushow at gmail.com where I will assign you a fake name or you can make one up yourself. But let's get some questions going. Let's get some dialogue going. I am enjoying putting out this content, and I hope you are enjoying listening to it. I appreciate all the subscriptions as they keep growing and growing. 
uh, which I'm quite overwhelmed by. But I'm going to keep booking these fantastic guests, and I hope you keep listening. I've got some really, really cool guests coming down the pipe, as I think Scott alluded to uh, this week, and I'm not going to spoil it, but a small hint, he coaches the number one player in the world currently. This episode and all episodes of The Golf Guru Show was produced by myself, Jason Sutton. Music is by Zach Mullet, a.k.a. Cut of Beats. Thank you for uh, the Space Jam. Leave me an iTunes review. Let me know how I'm doing. Send me a rating. That would be cool. And as I leave you with every episode, I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope that you go study. I hope that you go practice. And I hope that you go teach somebody else because that's what it's all about, leaving a legacy. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.